Good. Oh, there he is. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lisa Boscola, Senator Lisa Boscola, <coughs> Democratic Policy Chair. Um, before I offer some just really brief remarks, I wanted to thank my good friend John Udichek for hosting this today. I mean, he's been a champion of these issues, and he actually put this whole roundtable uh, discussion together. Wouldn't be here without him. I want to thank the folks from King's College for hosting this event. It's a very beautiful facility. And I also want to especially thank Kathleen Kane, our Attorney General, for being here. Um, as many of you know, Senator Udichek has spearheaded legislative efforts to curb gang violence in northeastern Pennsylvania and throughout Pennsylvania. His imprint, and I always say he, is, he has an imprint, um, has been on a host of bills that would toughen criminal penalties and curb the spread of gang violence. The outstanding quality of today's panel, when you look around and you see everybody out on the panel, um, our state police commissioner, Kathleen Kane, um, so many law enforcement officers and experts. It says a lot about John's um, efforts and, and work on this issue. Uh, according to the state police crime report, someone becomes a victim of violent crime every 11 minutes. And um, when you give that statistic to some people, they don't believe it. But it is. Every 11 minutes, somebody becomes a victim of a violent crime. And the frightening truth is that these big city crimes and gang violence, it's rapidly making the way into smaller communities as well throughout our state. And that's why all of us have a vested interest in trying to figure out what to do. Uh, making matters worse, many of the smaller urban centers, which are barely managing to fund basic services for their citizens, do not have the kinds of tools or resources that they need to fully monitor, investigate, and eradicate gang violence in their own communities. So for today's discussion, I hope we can get some innovative ideas, ways we can step up our efforts to um, against gang violence, and perhaps, you know, maybe there's additional tools where we can pull resources, perhaps we can enlist greater support and involvement from our citizens, perhaps we can do more to discourage children from idolizing gang members or joining gangs in the first place, and perhaps we need to take additional steps to look at the legislative level to toughen our laws and get violent criminals off our streets. So for the most part, we want your feedback perspective on the problems you face here in Wilkes-Barre, Hazleton, Piston. It, it's all over Pennsylvania. And while I'm sure that some of the problems you face are unique to this region, I would guess that smaller cities and communities throughout Pennsylvania have many of the same problems that you're experiencing. So we want to get a sense of what has worked what's working, what's not working, uh, how we can do better as legislators to help solve problems um, and, and not be the problem. That's the other thing I want to say. Sometimes we legislate and maybe uh, legislation can sometimes uh, not do what it was supposed to do or be intended to do in the first place and can actually harm your efforts. And that's what we want to know. So I want to thank the panelists for attending. I want to recognize Senator Udichek for some opening comments because um, he has spearheaded this effort. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Boscola, and good morning. Uh, thank you uh, to Senator Boscola for bringing the Senate Democratic Policy Committee to the great city of Wilkes-Barre on this important topic of crime in northeastern Pennsylvania. I want to thank uh, Senator Costa, the Democratic leader, uh, and my Senate colleagues who have joined us today, Senator Blake, Senator Furlow, Senator Schwank, Senator Wozniak. Thank you all uh, for joining us today on this important topic. Thank you to our distinguished panel uh, for agreeing to join us in this open and honest discussion so that we can address uh, the rising violent crime rate in northeastern Pennsylvania. And I would pause to also thank the very distinguished audience uh, that is here. We have many leaders uh, from our schools, from our chambers of commerce, uh, from all kinds of activists, our crime watch groups, uh, community leaders from across the board in northeastern Pennsylvania. Thank you for being here. Uh, to have this discussion today. Regrettably, violent crime, the gri violent crime rate in Wilkes-Barre and Hazleton, Luzerne County's two largest cities, both exceed the state and national average. Violent crime rate is not, however, just a problem for our cities. Recently, in the borough of Plymouth, a drug deal gone bad resulted in a gruesome triple homicide that shocked the residents 
of a small community. What residents of Luzerne County used to see only in crime dramas they watched on TV. Murder, drug deals, assaults, home invasions, and abductions are becoming all too commonplace in our daily news. In 2011, the Eastern Pennsylvania Drug and Gang Threat Assessment produced by the United States Department of Justice confirmed what many citizens believed was already happening in our communities. Violent crime, drug trafficking, and gang activity were all on the rise in our cities, townships, and boroughs. The Department of Justice report pointed to the transition from transient gang operations to more permanent drug trafficking operations in our community, and it articulated several reasons for the increase in violent crime, including easy access to drug distribution centers like New York City, less competition, higher retail prices and profits, less law enforcement pressure, and the easy recruitment of juveniles into gang operations. I believe the Department of Justice report aptly identified the problem. It is now our charge as leaders, both in the Commonwealth and here in our community, to find the solutions. I again thank you all for being here, particularly the panelists. Thank you for the great work you do every day to keep our community safe. Let's start our discussion with our Attorney General, Kathleen King, if you could say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here, and thank you for inviting me. This really is an impressive roundtable of law enforcement as well as legislative um, representatives. We have a large job to do in the Commonwealth, particularly here in the Northeast, and this is my hometown, so it is a particular importance to me. We have seen an increase in crime. We've seen an increase in drug activity and gang activity. We have to work together to eradicate it. A lot of our local municipal police forces are, um, because of budget reasons, they are being stretched thin, which also means that the state police who then cover the areas, uh, once the law enforcement, uh, they're not on duty or they don't have the manpower to cover, they are also stretched thin. And the Attorney General's office is also, we have a large force in Pennsylvania that we are looking to really work within the communities. We usually, we, we have a uh, Bureau of Narcotics investigation, we have special investigations as well as criminal investigations, drug strike task force, and a gun violence task force in Philadelphia. But what we really want to do is to work together with local law enforcement, local district attorneys, the DEA and the FBI and the state police, so that we have a force multiplier on the ground, on the streets, where the crime is happening. I'm a big believer in we need to get together, figure out what the problem is and how we're going to solve it, but then we need to get out onto the streets and actually solve it. So I think this is a great step forward in doing that and figuring out what the problems are, what the solutions are going to be, and how we're going to work together. The Attorney General's Office, along with Senator Ujicak, have put together a proposal for a mobile, crime, a mobile street crimes unit. And what that means is exactly what I said. We will get together with the district attorneys, we will get together with their detectives, the local police, the state police, the DEA and the FBI, as well as the schools, and we will have a comprehensive approach. We will make sure that we have enough manpower on those streets to identify uh, where the hot spots are. We will cultivate CIs. We will make sure that we have the manpower to safely go into drug houses. And we will also get into the schools and make sure that that we identify at-risk children and we make sure that we educate children so that they do not become part of the gangs. We want just as much to punish those who are guilty as we want to make sure that the crime does not come into your families, that you are not the victim of a crime. It's just as important to us. So what we're doing here today is we're having, we're making solutions. But as I always, I've been going around to a lot of the schools lately and as I've been saying, I not only want you to not be a part of the problem, but I want you to be a part of the solution. And we need your input. I'm thrilled to see we have such a great audience here today. I want you to give us your thoughts, what's happening in your area, what your ideas are, and then we'll tell you what we're doing and hopefully we can come up with some practical solutions to solve this problem. We want to come to areas like yours because you are being hardest hit. Your area, Reading, there are some areas out in the West that are being hard hit. And we want to make sure that we create a comprehensive force that will make sure that your neighborhoods go back to what they used to be and to what you deserve them to be. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. 
Commissioner Noonan, uh, we've heard from our top prosecutor. How about from our top cop? One of the questions that will start the discussion, uh, we rely heavily on uh, the UCR reports uh, that are managed out of, out of the state police. Uh, that was just mandated uh, just back in 2004 to give us a better picture uh, of, of what kind of crime is happening in our communities. One of the things that strikes me uh, about it is that there's over 1,700 jurisdictions that provide uh, data for those reports. Uh, we all know about the fragmentation uh, of local governments in Pennsylvania, and that means a fragmentation in the delivery of law enforcement services. <clears throat> can, you, can you speak to, to that question as you know, a former member of the Attorney General, former FBI agent, former or current uh, police commissioner uh, for our state police, in the fragmentation of that delivery of, uh, of law enforcement? I mean, in the Department of Justice report, one of the things it speaks to <clears throat> is that there were less police on the street. Uh, we had a public uh, meeting in Hazleton recently. And we highlighted uh, a, a statistic that 25 years ago, Luzerne County, 60% 60, 60 of the municipalities had full-time police. Today, only 6%. Uh, our cities have managed to keep their forces, but our townships and boroughs have relied more on the state police. Can you speak to what we can do to deal with that fragmentation? Yes. Uh it does seem to be an awfully lot of police entities, 1,700, as you spoke. That's an awful lot. And what's happened is not just that there's 1,700. Of those 1,700, almost all of them are diminished. They don't have the same amount of people. And I'd just like to point something out to you when I was getting ready for this. Uh, New York City in the 1990s had a terrible problem with law enforcement. They increased their police department by 35%. New York City is the safest big city in the country today. Contrast that with Camden. Uh, in 2010, they cut their police department in half. Drug dealers on the street <coughs> printed out T-shirts that said, 2011, now it's our turn. And they were right. <coughs> and if you, don't, if you want to make a test, take a drive through Camden and take a drive through New York City. And, and you, won't, you won't need any more illustrations. There is a direct correspondence to the lack of law enforcement officers on the street and to the crimes that we see. I rested, uh, I've worked up here for about 30 years in the Northeast, and uh, I was always curious, why do these people come here, like from New York City or Philadelphia and, and some of these other uh, larger, sir? And I got a, uh, I rested a guy for uh, drugs from uh, Washington Heights section in, uh, in uh, New York City. I said, how did you get here to Hazleton? He says, I was at the laundromat, and somebody told me you could get $1,100 for an ounce of cocaine in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. I got in my car, drove here, and I've been here ever since. That's the attraction, is you can almost double your money by coming to the Northeast from the, from the big cities. We, uh, and uh, certainly the men, and, and uh, one woman is sitting with me today, we work very closely, we've worked very closely, the state police and all of these departments that are all my good friends that we've worked with for, for many, many years. And they do absolutely the best they can do. And we have pooled our resources, we coordinate all of our actions. There is no longer what, uh, what you used to see maybe 10, 15 years ago where people uh, kept everything to themselves. We share information now almost, uh, on, well, on a daily basis. And whenever we need help, we know where to go. We will ask them for help. They ask us for help. But I think we're going to reach a point. You take a look at these little towns. So say we work in Wilkesbury, and we put a big push on in Wilkesbury. Well, then they move to the little towns right outside. And, and that overwhelms their law enforcement agency. So it is a huge problem. I think, I think coordination, I think cooperation is at an all-time high. But manpower is at an all-time low. And I think that's something we really have to, uh, to look at. And I just want to make one other point. When, we, when I've looked at these, and I have looked at all the homicides and the violence that you see connected with gang violence, it's so unpredictable. Like, what generates? It doesn't make sense what generates the, uh, it, it's not usually gang war. It's somebody says something in a bar, people start shooting. Uh, it, it's not how you can pinpoint and say, okay, these are, this is somebody that's going to be violent. It's the whole situation. It's all about drugs and money and, and in many respects, hopelessness that these people come, come to this area with no other intention than to commit <clears throat> crimes until they're either caught and sent to jail or someone kills them. 
And uh, I'm sure everyone here has, has a lot of stories just like that, but manpower is a big issue, and I'm glad that I'm sitting next to Senator Blake right now because we've had many conversations about cities because what happens in these mid-sized cities if the crime problem gets bigger, then people don't come to the cities to do business, which makes the budgets go down, less law enforcement, it's a vicious cycle. It's so important that people feel safe coming into Hazleton, Wilkesbury, or Scranton, because otherwise those communities are going to die. And it's a, uh, it's a real problem, and, I, and I'm so glad that uh, everyone here is, uh, is looking at it, because I think it's extremely important for the future of our state. What models, and, and, and this will be open uh, to, to everyone on the panel, but first to uh, Commissioner Noonan, uh, that it, crime is regional in nature. Yes. I mean, you mentioned, you know, of course, Scranton, Wilkesbury, Hazleton, all along the 81 corridor. You have Interstate 80, you have 476, you have Route uh, 222 in the Lehigh Valley and uh, Interstate 78. All, all these corridors, and these, we understand that these drug trafficking operations these folks are entrepreneurs. If you can have a higher profit and less resistance from uh, uh, from police officers, you're, you're going to want to do business in that area. So turning that around, the Camden model that you, you, you used and saying New York City put their foot down, how do you develop the regional partnerships? Because obviously the city of Hazleton, which has now I think 36 officers, correct Chief? 36 officers, but yet the greater Hazleton area has a population of 40,000 people, same population as the city of Wilkes-Barre. city of Wilkes-Barre has 91 police officers, 91 versus 35, same population, and then I'm sure Chief uh, DeSoy would want more officers uh, on the street. Uh, how do we create, as Attorney General mentioned, that force multiplier with our departments, recognizing that small townships and boroughs uh, are, are going in a different direction? They're either relying completely on the state police or, or diminished to part-time uh, police departments. Mm -hmm. How do we turn that tide to create a regional partnership, recognizing that there are certain resources at the FBI level, state police level, attorney general level, the DAs, but the boots on the ground are our local departments. H how do we build up those local departments? I've been a proponent of regionalization to try to build that. We haven't been successful in creating a regional department in, in Luzerne County just yet. There are some in the Monroe County area. Uh, how do we build uh, the boots on the ground at the local level? Well, uh, every study I think that's ever been done has advocated for regionalization of police departments. But I think we will get to Mars before we will ever see it. It just doesn't seem to ever happen. Uh, I don't know that we can, I, I don't know that we could increase the cooperation that we have already with the other, the law enforcement uh, 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 authorities that are, that are going on right now uh, and, uh, and in the communities. What happens is like with the state police or with the attorney general's office, our resources are finite. And so although, you know, we may be aware and the, the, as I worked for many years with the attorney general's office on their drug strike force, the task force that operates here in Luzerne County and do an outstanding job, uh, those are all great things. I, I don't think that there's a problem with, with force multipliers, as far as I can call the FBI, I could call the DEI, I could call any law enforcement agencies, the Attorney General's office, we'd be together. That's not a problem. The problem is none of us have really all that many people. And, and all, my, my good friend Frank DeAndrea down there with Hazleton, who I've been, we've been working with, and, and, and uh, Jerry DeSoy. If I put more people working mm -hmm. in Hazleton, I have to take them from someplace else and we cover over 80% of the state. So it, it, it becomes hard as, uh, as in some of the communities where they've disbanded their police departments. This is my biggest fear. I know that economic times are tough, but the state police is not set up to be the police force for the cities and for these municipal uh, areas. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm worried that this trend as it continues will put a, a, a tremendous burden on us and I'm sure on the Attorney General's office. Senator, uh, I echo the Colonel's sentiments. I, I don't think that there's any possible way. First of all, let me remove the word think from this statement. There's absolutely no way the city of Hazleton could survive without the assistance that we get from the state police and the attorney general's office and the district attorney's office right now. 
Um, they pay for our task force members. We are fortunate enough to be able to run every drug investigation we do through the Attorney General's office. In exchange, we get uh, an unprecedented amount of support. Um, they pay for overtime. They assist us with manpower, with equipment. We have a task force officer who is the auto theft task force. He's a member, basically, of the state police. The state police pay for his entire salary, his vehicle, his gasoline, and they give us seven to eight officers on a moment's notice to come in and do auto theft investigations, serious crime investigations. We get that with the DEA through a task force officer. We get that through the FBI. The city could not afford, we would never be able to combat either our drug problem, our violent crime problem, um, our auto theft problem. They all roll into one without the assistance we already get. The problem is, other than the colonel, I, I don't know of anyone who loves the state police more than me. My wife is a corporal in the state police. I, I retired from the state police. If you cut me, I probably still bleed gray. But the fact is, it's always less with more. When I understand that, uh, is the state police down a thousand officers from your complement? No, 500. Uh, 500 officers from their complement. The attorney general's office was being considered <clears throat> to have their funding cut for <clears throat> their staff. We all recognize that this battle is boots on the street. It's why I wear a uniform every day, why I drive a marked car. It's the, it's the officer presence. The problem is that these agencies, which all of these municipalities depend on, have run out of boots to put on the street. And if, if they send their boots to Hazleton, what happens to West Hazleton and Freeland and Exeter and all of the, you know, up north. And, and so if they come into my city for two weeks and we just arrest everything that moves and isn't nailed down, the problem is when they go to the next problem, my problem still exists. So I look at this solution as it's, it's not a, as much a throwing money at something issue as it is trying to figure out how to substantiate resources. Uh, resources in additional officers for the state level, and that all trickles down. I mean, I, I'm not saying I don't need more officers by every statistic I ever look at. We're down probably 20 police officers from what we should have. I don't expect the city of Hazleton to ever be able to afford an extra $2 million a year. At the same time, if I could figure out how to fund some of these other agencies for them to bring their complement back up, they all come to the city. So I think it's a combination of of both of, of those, yes, I'd like to be able to figure out how to get more officers for me personally, but I'd also like to see <clears throat> their staff supported. I, I couldn't have, I don't think in, in my entire career in the state police, I ever had any idea what municipal policing was like till I became the chief of a municipal police department. And now I recognize firsthand that if I don't maintain these friendships, we could never survive as a department. Well, it's, it's encouraging to see the cooperation uh, at the highest levels, uh, both on the prosecuting side and in and, and the uh, law enforcement side. But deployment, Chief, you mentioned deployment. I think this is very important. One of the points made in the Department of Justice report was we, we knew what was going on with the drug trafficking in, in Hazleton uh, in the mid-2000s, to early 2000s. Uh, but those outside of Hazleton looked as, well, that's Hazleton's problem. Well, by 2010, that became Wilkes-Barre's problem, Kingston, the greater Wyoming Valley, uh, be because we didn't attack it as a regional problem. We looked at it as, as the problem of Wilkes-Barre, and that's how folks look at the city of uh, Wilkes-Barre, uh, Chief, that, uh, you know, that's, that's a city problem. But, uh, you know, we're, we're one county, we're one community. It, how do we, in, in those communities that are not taking part of where they do sign up and just take over 80% of the communities in the, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, just signing up for state police coverage, which, as you mentioned, that's really not your role, and, and you can't execute that role. So, and, and maybe, Chief, uh, and you've worked with, with Chief uh, DeSoy for some of the other communities, uh, particularly with the camera system here in, in, in Wilkes-Barre, and partnering with those communities. How do we get to the point where we recognize the city of Wilkes-Barre, the city of Hazleton, uh, the city of Nanticoke, the city of Pittston, the third-class cities, they're not going to have the resources. Uh, they've, they, they've been diminished in terms of their tax base. So, so how do they tackle uh, uh, the heavier crime load that 
by the way, is going to spill over that municipal boundary that's just across the street, just across Main Street in some cases. Uh, you know, I always use the example of, of Kingston and, and Edwardsville. I mean, literally, it depends on which side of the yellow line you fall on on what community you're going to be in, Kingston and Edwardsville. Uh, and that happens a lot. Uh, how do, so how do we build those, those boots on the ground in, in getting a regional partnership outside of a regional police department, which uh, the chief is, uh, the commissioner is absolutely correct. It's been so difficult. But there are other uh, opportunities, kind of regional service districts, where, where you can pull your resources, your financial resources, <clears throat> to do that. And, and I'd love for Chief DeSoy and Chief Schultz from Nanico, who, who has to deal with uh, many of these same problems in, in, in Nanico. Well, we, um, law enforcement <clears throat> has recognized that problem. We have recognized the need for some type of regionalization. Uh, the uh, uh, Madam Attorney General, if it wasn't for her generosity and her predecessor's generosity with the drug task forces, uh, drug enforcement in the city of Wilkes-Barre would be simply a word. It would not be a fact. I'm serious about that. We would make efforts on a patrol level to make some arrests. We would do some long-term investigations, but quite frankly, it wouldn't really be effective. It's the Attorney General's office supplying us not only money, but the assistance with the manpower. Now, uh, Madam Attorney General referenced force multipliers. That's what her agency has been to us uh, since the, the inception of the task force. It allows me to use my individual officers internally as force multipliers. And you say, well, that's, that's oxymoronic. Well, it isn't. It allows me to bring my officers back off duty to work an exclusive drug assignment. So that patrol officer who's out there working from call to call, domestics and all type of, of, of uh, standard police work, then can be brought out on specific cases and work solely on drug cases if we agree that drugs are our, our most significant problem. And that's what we've been doing for years. Additionally, the state police, the, the state police, and a lot of people don't realize this, the state police uh, drug unit works in the city of Wilkes-Barre. And we offer, we offer to them what the Attorney General's office uh, offers to us. We offer them the ability to be a force multiplier uh, for their uh, officers that are in the city. We can identify the people quicker. We can provide them intelligence quicker simply because our officers are literally boots on the ground. We are there. We know uh, who's who. Uh, I, much as, as uh, Chief DeAndrea said, I also have an officer assigned to DEA on the task force. Huge, huge, huge help in, in these, these long-term difficult cases, cases that we could never, never finance. It, it, unfortunately, it all comes down to one thing. It comes down to money. And again, as, as Chief DeAndrea said, it, and it's not just the municipalities asking, the small police departments, <clears throat> myself included, asking, we need money for more manpower. We're saying the state attorney general's office, the state police, they need more m manpower because they're the people that are really helping us. So it has to be across the board. You just can't build up a municipal police department and say, well, that'll solve the problem. It may solve that problem in that small area, but it's certainly not going to, to solve a problem that you're looking to solve countywide, regional, statewide. And I really think I'm a great proponent of regionalization, and, and I know you have been, sir, and, and, and your troubles and your, your uh, difficulties in, in, in trying to get that instituted. Uh, maybe our efforts, maybe your efforts might now be better addressed by working with the Attorney General's Office and the State Police and using it as a trickle-down effect. So, that, so the strike force that uh, Attorney General Kane is talking about, a street uh, crime strike force uh, modeled after the success of the drug task force, do you believe that would be effective in, in providing additional Absolutely. tools for you? Absolutely. 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 Chief Schultz, if you'd like to comment on I've been a member since the task force since its inception in 1985 <laughs> under Leroy Zimmerman, and we have worked well with the Attorney General's office and, and Pennsylvania State Police since that time. Um, numerous, numerous times, uh, Colonel Noonan, when he was with the, uh, the Attorney General's office, I sat in his office. We have spent many hours together uh, working investigations and uh, the uh, Attorney General's office uh, is, is a credit and, and I believe that them and Pennsylvania State Police should receive some type of more funding for that purpose to not only combat the drugs, but the gangs. And they're all integrated together. 
uh, gangs and drugs are all together. That's what this is all about. There's just one other thing I, I want to point out. Boots on the ground, I think, is critical. But also, uh, we <clears throat> have to be able to prosecute those people. And some of the district attorneys, and I believe the district attorney in Luzerne County, and these agents, like, they're also getting squeezed. And where this comes in to affect us, it does no good for anybody for somebody to be arrested and then to have their charges linger or pled down because you don't have the resources to take these cases to trial uh, because you just are overwhelmed. And, and that's something that this is a two-pronged, I believe, problem, just like law and order. You got the first half hour is, is the uh, investigation, then the prosecution. And if I, if I may. Um, it, it, exactly like the commissioner said, that we are being squeezed left and right. I lost, when I came in in January 2012, I lost five ADAs. Then I um, was told to, um, this year, that I was going to lose a detective. I don't have enough detectives to help these local municipalities um, in Luzerne County. Like you said, Senator Udicek, one county, one community. We are here in Luzerne County. Luzerne County's district attorney's office is here to help these local police departments. But if we can't do that, where does the help come from? They look to the AG's office. They look to the state police. And they are being squeezed as well. We need to address uh, the criticism that's going, uh, being directed towards my office from the government, the local government, uh, the county government on why money is needed in the district attorney's office. Um, I have recently scheduled a meeting with all of my assistant district attorneys because we're addressing the issues within our office. Um, they are overwhelmed, overworked. They, they don't have enough time to prepare for their <clears throat> cases. How do I expect them to go in and give 110% when they don't have the time to do that? We need so many more ADAs. We need, and I'm sure the general can tell you, we need 10 more detectives to help fight this crime. And if we don't get that funding, this is just going to keep on going. And we're going to see these issues keep on going. So what it does come down to, it, it comes down to funding in the local areas. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to open up because I, I know we're talking about more troopers, more policemen, uniforms on the street, et cetera, et cetera. But I have the same problem in Johnstown. The crime is driven by people from out of town for the most part, and it's drugs. What are we doing to reduce the market? Because that's what's driving it. Where, where there's demand, they're going to go there. How are we reaching the young people and trying to tamper off and taper off their use of drugs so that they don't want to come to these areas because the kids aren't getting addicted anymore? I can answer that question for okay. you. Um, we have a, um, what we're, we're doing is we gather a lot of national intelligence as well as state intelligence from our BNI, from the state police, from the local forces that we work with. And we're not only just arresting the street dealers, we're going back to where the supply is coming from. And we also are running wires along with the state police and the FBI to intercept the drug shipments that are coming in. So a lot of the times the, um, the Mexican cartels, and they are supplying the biggest amount of drugs to the United States as well as to Pennsylvania. So what we're trying to do is cut the shipment off when it comes in right into Pennsylvania. It will go either to Reading or to <coughs> Philadelphia. Then they will break it up into smaller pieces and they will send it out to their dealers. Now the dealers were typically in Pennsylvania regular street dealers that we've all seen for many, many, many years. What they have done is that they've cut out the middleman and they have taken part of the, they've taken those street dealers and they've made them a part of their supply network and their supply chain. So we're arresting the dealers, but we're going back to where the supply is coming from. And we're also working with the national attorneys generals and national intelligence to cut it off before it even gets to Pennsylvania. We do have, um, we have a lot of work to do in that area, there's no doubt. We use the resources that we have because we have the authorization to conduct wiretaps. We work very well, I think, with the federal authorities in cutting off those shipments, but it, it really does come down to resources. I mean, we only have a certain amount of people on our force. We have cut overtime, so we can only run these wires, uh, you know, from eight until five, and then after that, it's got to be specifically approved, but we had to cut overtime because our budget may be cut by $6 million this year. So we are being strapped. Um, but what we're also talking about here is we're being reactive. 
we're all just trying to keep our heads above the water. Isn't that right? When we see, we're going out onto the street, we're identifying CIs, and we're taking down the dealers and the users. Well, we're trying to go back and find the supply, but we need to be proactive as well. <clears throat> we're keeping our head above the water, but that's not solving the problem. So what this, the Mobile Street Crimes Unit is in effect an ideological regionalization plan without actually regionalizing anyone. It's having a dedicated central area, a dedicated team, somebody you know that you can call, not on a reactive approach, but on a proactive approach. They are the ones who are going to work and then cultivate the intelligence. I'm sorry about that. Cultivate the intelligence. And we're going to try and get to it before it gets to Pennsylvania. So we need to be reactive, yes, but we also need to be proactive. What our office and the state police does because of our statewide jurisdiction is we can cross county lines. So we can work with Luzerne County, Lackawanna County, Carbon County, Schuylkill County, and make sure that once we move it um, from Luzerne County or from Hazleton or, or um, Wilkes-Barre, it's going to be like the bubble. They're going to go to Scranton or they're going to go to Carbon County or they're going to go someplace else we can pick up that team and we can move them. And we can follow them wherever they go. Eventually we want it to be known that, you know what, it is not worth doing business here in Pennsylvania. Right now it is. The drugs are cheaper, they're pure, and we have a market for it. So we do have a problem. But I just want to make sure that we all know that we can't just keep our heads above the water because it's not working. Our neighborhoods are being overrun. Our schools are being overrun. We need to work with the school districts so that kids aren't becoming members of gangs. And Senator Udichak's legislation that um, made it a crime to even recruit kids into a gang was a very proactive approach, and that's exactly what we need. So we do work together. I'm glad that we can help you, and we will continue to help you. We not only supply the, um, the officers and the agents on the streets, but we can also help with the, the attorneys and the deputy attorney generals who can go into court, so maybe lessen the burden of some of your ADAs, but it is still not enough. We have to be more proactive. Okay, but that, 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 wasn't my, that wasn't my question. I appreciate that. Right, but my I, question I was, is the demand in them? How do we stop people from getting addicted and purchasing it? How do we reach those young people to prevent it in the first place? Because they're coming, they're coming here because they have a demand. How do we reduce the demand is my question. Well, that's right. That's right. That's right. It's probably appropriate. Right at the beginning, Senator Bascola's remarks, which he said is, uh, and very briefly, but she said, what are we doing to discourage kids from joining those gangs? And uh, Senator Wozniak has now echoed that and made it a direct question. We have a kind of unique project in the Hazleton area, and it's just blossoming now. But I think it's a critically important project because understanding that our population has kind of exploded in Hazleton. We have a large group of Hispanic uh, people coming in, some who are language challenged, and it was a very rapid kind of influx of uh, a new wave of immigration. So uh, we sat down as a nonprofit organization, very recently minted, so to speak. However, we started taking a look at what the, some of the problems were and what we might be able to do about it. And one of the things we saw is um, if you take a look at the high schools, for instance, and you go back about 15, 20 years, each of the communities uh, in the Hazleton area that is uh, part of the 40,000 had high schools. And you take a look at what the law of unintended consequence is. So you consolidate that into a single high school, and it seems like a really good financial move. But now you've taken, just think about this, you've got 16 kids playing basketball in a high school, right? 16 children. But you had 64 before because there were four high schools. Now if you are not an elite athlete, what's left for you? So you've got 16 kids. So we're starting to look, what about intramural sports? And the other things, it's not only police that have been cut, but social service agencies. Uh, these budget cuts cut deep all over the place and not just police. And I'm not naive. I believe it, just as every one of you guys said, the same thing. Boots on the ground is the answer. Visibility is the answer, but it's not the sole answer. All of us have to play this role. Uh, the legislatures have to play their role, the police play their role, and the social service agencies have to play the role as well. In the city of Hazleton, when we were growing up, from sunup till, till sundown, there were two college kids on every playground in that city. Now, we can't afford to do that anymore. But 
what a resource that was, that you could actually send your kids. Uh, and they did, all over the city. You had all of these, these resources, and you had athletic things going on. You had cultural activities, arts and crafts, all summer long. So what we saw was a great need, particularly with people who are economically disadvantaged, and a lot of the newcomers in our area are. They may not be able to take advantage of the regular resources that are available. So we're started, we just purchased a school building, and with that 64,000 square foot school building, we want to give our kids an opportunity to come after school during the summer months and to have structured activities in education, cultural activities, athletic activities, where maybe they couldn't afford to go somewhere else, but every parent will know their child is safe when they're there, that they're doing something structured, and that that, I think, is part of the answer. And there's other social service agencies doing the same types of things. And, but we've all got to work on this together. This is not a single solution. Boots on the ground doesn't do it. We can't do it. You guys can't do it. But it's a team effort. And until we all get together and understand what those priorities are, we're all going to struggle. Yeah. I think from a big picture point of view, whether or not you're talking about more police in the area or more programming, whatever it might be, there's a catch-22 issue in dealing with any of those issues. And, and I think most people will agree that probably the number one reason we have more crime, and particularly more violent crime, it's a reflection of our current economic times. And whether it's uh, increased unemployment, stagnant wages, more people at the poverty level, that's all leading toward more crime being committed, and particularly more violent crime being committed. And the catch-22 is that with those tough economic times, there is a reaction to maybe reduce funding for certain things. And whether it's programming, uh, as, as uh, Mr. Curry was indicating, or as some of the police are talking about, that's going to yield to less people, less programming. Uh, there are going to be less uh, people able to get the help that they need. And it's all back to money. So some way we've got to kind of figure out that circle and realize that, realize that money uh, is going to put more police on the ground. Money is going to create more programs. And we've got some so, somehow get away from that thinking that the reaction is to do away with money <coughs> Uh, because the times are tight. Uh, it's a matter of balancing. I realize that's easy to say, but I think that's the real key to accomplishing some of the, some of the answer to our problems. Yeah, I'd like, like to say, uh, just based on what you said, um, about investing, really, our dollars, and where can we choose or should we choose to invest those dollars. And I really think uh, that we need to focus on making investments in our most prized possession, uh, which impacts our today, but more importantly, our tomorrow, and that is our children. So we need to make sure that we're investing in our kids and in, in not just in education, albeit we absolutely need to fix education. I don't think there's anyone at this table that would disagree that we need to move that ball forward. But what we need to understand and what I've learned through my experience over the last 10 months with building bridges and actually getting into the community, talking with parents and also the children, uh, is that they feel ignored and there's a sense of hopelessness, believe it or not, within our young children, which is dangerous because that leads to behaviors that ultimately lead to actions or desires for action like drinking, drugs, alcohol, et cetera, which then leads to future events of criminal behavior. So I, I think, you know, if we want to look at situations on the surface, it is what it is and we must address and deal with it. But if we want to get to root cause, we've got to go to fourth grade and we've got to put investment and focus on those children from eight to three while they're in school. But let's not forget about three to 11, because quite honestly, as a parent myself and having conversations with these children throughout our community, it used to be eight to three affected my three to 11. Now, three to 11 affects them eight to three. 
And, and I, just, I just believe through, so I don't have all the statistics that you guys have, but through experience and conversation, we've, we've got to make that investment in that time frame of those kids' lives. That will serve to reduce crime long-term moving forward, uh, attacking that marketplace that Senator Wozniak mentioned. And, and there's, there's some great programs before we, we leave this topic. It, it, in one of the most alarming things, uh, to, to Reverend Walker's point, one of the most alarming things that through our experience with Operation Gang Up when we had the experts uh, from the FBI Academy up was the, the, the target age uh, that these gangs were looking at. Not seniors in high school, elementary schools, 10 to 12 years of age. And like you, Reverend, I have four daughters, I have four children, uh, all under the age of seven. That was an alarming thing for me as a parent and certainly as a, as, as a policymaker and how you tackle and you recognize it's certainly law enforcement. And that's why we've tried to craft this. We, we understand this is, this is going to be uh, uh, several facets. It's going to be the schools. And we have folks here uh, like Joe DeLuca from the LIU who, who's uh, uh, spearheading their safe school initiative. We have a safe school initiative going through the General Assembly with Senator Lisa Baker and Senator Joe Scarnati working with members of the Democratic Caucus and trying to find funding. But there's one program in particular down in uh, in Carbon County that I know uh, DA DeBias is familiar with, the SHINE program, which just which is probably one of the more successful after-school programs. That critical time between two and six before the parents get home when they're not uh, uh, supervised by an adult, whether it, or have those constructive programs, whether it's athletics or, or, or the arts. Uh, the SHINE program, and, it, and it's been in existence for nearly 10 years, started by Senator uh, uh, Rhodes, uh, uh, it, it, from uh, Schuylkill County, that has recently been cut back. Could you talk a little bit about how, how important that SHINE program is? Not only has it helped them academically, 98% of the kids advance in terms of their academics, but really in engaging parents. And this is one comment that I don't think has been brought up yet. I mean, 80, there's an 85% increase in the participation of parents in their children's life through programs like SHINE. So I, I think that's very important that the parents uh, also have to be a part of this equation with our, it with is. our young well, what, what the Reverend said before is so important that, uh, you know, too often we focus just on the school period or just on the after school period, but that connection between the two is so very important. And uh, uh, my wife is a teacher and, you know, some of the issues that they deal with in school, they, they, they get help at, at uh, uh, dealing with those issues, but they have to likewise get help dealing with the issues at home. And bridging the connection between the two is so very important. So uh, again, it's, it's, it gets back to what I said before in terms of money. I mean, it's, it's easy in tough uh, economic, or in easy economic times, when times are really good to have money uh, spent on these programs. But when there are tough economic times, it's so easy to say we're going to cut back on whether it's a SHINE program or some of the in-school programs or some of the after-school programs. Uh, and the consequences are uh, people get more involved in crime and we're seeing an increased crime rate. Senator, it, it, hopefully I could add something that might be part of the solution because Hazleton couldn't wait for the funding. Um, we have a law that every school district has to have a bullying policy. What they're going to do if you're proven to be a bully. The problem was when I, I was fortunate enough to chair the bullying committee for days in our school district. We have a phenomenal policy. We had the policy before it was actually a law. But we sat back and looked at it and think, but it doesn't seem fair that we're going to punish people, because now we have the rules of how to punish them, yet we're not doing anything to teach them why they shouldn't be bullies and how that affects the community. So what the Hazel Mary School District did was we set up a committee. It took us over 18 months, and we studied every possible way of bullying and what was out there. There's only one that's currently funded by the state, and that would be the Olveus program. The problem was that the district didn't have the money to hire people. So we wrote a curriculum to train every employee, which was 2,000 plus employees, and over 10,000 students. And we stood that up in October, and we used it. I mean, when you stop to think about it, where better than a school district to get people to build an educational component? They have more degrees than a thermometer, most of them. So <laughs> the fact is, why do I need to go outside? So instead of waiting for funding, 
um, I was again fortunate enough to chair the committee. I have a vested interest. I have six children. Three of them are still in the Hazleton Area School District. This is my future, but we built a curriculum. We're now teaching bully education that's not costing the school a cent to over 10,000 students. There's 23 weeks of bully education. But bully education is critical because that's my anti-gang tool. I'm now teaching everybody from kindergarten <coughs> through 12th grade. They're getting 23 weeks of intensive anti-bullying education, which I would say this is a component that I wish that you know, the senators would put the law out to explain to every district. You must have a bully education program. It doesn't have to cost you money. You can get with the principal Patronus here, Dr. Antonelli, and you could use that model that's only gonna cost you the cost of a workbook. And you can teach your kids 23 weeks a year. Um, I just think that that's the, the critical part of how do we, because to me, anti-bullying is anti-gang. I'm giving my kids values. I'm telling them how to stand up to these things. I'm giving them resources so they have other things to do instead of getting involved. You know, we're down to, I'll take you and show you the third and fourth graders that are being recruited into gangs. Um, so our alternative is how do I teach these kids to stand up against that? And that's where this educational component comes into play. So. Costa, I, know. I want to jump in <clears throat> very quickly and ask the, uh, Colonel Noonan and, and General Kane. A long time, for a number of years, Senate Democrats have advocated for uh, what we will call correction reform. And the last couple of years, we've worked closely with our colleagues in the Senate and we're successful in implementing a number of correction reforms. And while that's very important, the benefit was the cost savings associated with corrections and what we did with those cost savings. And now we've embarked <coughs> on a plan to drive those resources back into the community. And I'm interested to know exactly um, in the in crime prevention programs before activities start to take place. Uh, do each of your offices, I mean, I know PCCD and I think the state police and I think the general's office all have a role to play in terms of how we drive out those resources beginning, I believe, this next budget year. Uh, haven't you given much thought to that and whether or not which programs might be beneficial to drive some of these resources to when we start to achieve those savings? Well, we're working closely with PCCD, and that, that's generally the agency that we work with in, in, these, in these funds. And there's a, there's a number of them, but uh, the earlier we start, the better, as far as we're talking about gang activity. Uh, so I, the elementary schools, the middle schools are the areas that I'm, I'm looking for most. Uh, in the state police, I'm, I'm very proud of, we have a Camp Cadet program that is uh, privately funded, that operates throughout the state, that we take children, some of them that, that are a little disadvantaged, some of them not at all, some of them come from law enforcement families, and I try to expose them for a week to law enforcement, to give them some different values and a different approach to that. And uh, we have also our PIOs, our public information officers in every troop that go out and speak to the schools and try to work with them in that way. But uh, PCCD is, is the one that's carrying the ball as far as we're concerned, is for getting the money out to them. Yeah, but in terms of some of the things we've talked about today, you all have the opportunity to provide what we learned here today, for example, the role of these resources in a community to do a variety of different things. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to convey them through PCCD as we drive those resources out. Absolutely. Great. Okay. And Senator, we do have a, um, an outreach and education program at the Attorney General's office. They are spread out throughout the state. They reach thousands and thousands of children a year. Um, I am also a big believer in after school programs. The statistics do show that if children don't have anything to do between the hours of 3.30 and 6.30, their chances of committing a crime go up by 70%. We owe them more than that. They are still children, and we owe them some structure. Um, when the economy is down, you're right. They are hit the hardest, and I think it's up to us to provide that because, just like the chief said, that is an anti-gang measure. That is an anti-drug measure. It's an anti-gun measure. Um, so our outreach program goes out and talks about gangs, drugs, and guns. Um, we do do the best that we can on the resources that we have. But we also, our drug strike task force also then provides money to the local district attorneys so that they can then provide overtime to their detectives who are, you know, drugs don't happen between eight and four in the, in the, it, during the day. It's usually at night. So they can then have their people out on the street. Um, I'm also a big believer in the mentoring programs, um, the police athletic leagues, and the intermediary courts. 
I think it's best um, to have less criminals than more jails. And the intermediary courts gets to the root of the problem. So you have the drug court, you have mental health court, um, you have all, all kinds of DUI court, and they're aimed to make sure that we don't put a criminal in jail knowing that they have a mental illness and they're going to come back out and reoffend because of their mental illness. They come back out and hopefully they're healthier and they have the structure that they need to be productive cit citizens and the recidivism rate then goes down. So there's a number of things that I, I believe that actually really work. Um, but, you know, diversion and mentoring programs, outreach programs, drug task force, they are all of the things that we, we specifically need. And also having a centralized area of information and intelligence and being able to work together like we do. Great. Thank you. I wanted to get to this side of the panel too, Terry, Paul. Approximately two years ago, uh, Senator John Udichak co-founded a program called Operation Gang Up, uh, which our organization is coordinating here in northeastern Pennsylvania. And one of the cornerstones of Operation Gang Up is that of awareness and training. Um, not only uh, do we need to make sure that our schools, but our community groups and community leaders, volunteer coaches, and even parents uh, are aware of the gang signs and, and how to know what's happening, but, but also the children. And some of that is taking place. The critical thing to know and, and recognize is that national gangs are operating in northeastern Pennsylvania as well as local gangs. And uh, they are recruiting uh, both in the secondary schools and on college campuses. And what we found out through our research is that the gangs um, don't care about gender, they don't care about race, they don't care about ethnicity. Everyone is a target. And as the national gangs enter the foray of white collar crime, they're also looking for college students that are educated that can help them with things uh, like identity theft and money laundering. So it's a huge issue, but awareness is critical. Operation Gang Up has been in various school districts, has worked with a couple crime watch groups and community organizations uh, to provide that awareness and training um, so that people know what to look for. Some signs are very overt, like wearing the colors and, and uh, tattoos and others are not so overt. Um, but the challenge that we've had is reaching the parents because that's the one segment that really isn't participating in this kind of awareness program. So it, it's one of the future objectives of Gang Up is to work through the schools and to reach the parent, parents to create as much awareness as possible um, um, among families and family members to know in advance what's happening to their children. I, I want to jump in if I don't mind. Uh, you guys were talking about <clears throat> crime prevention. Uh, Senator Costa brought that up. And, you know, we're talking about the children. I <clears throat> certainly agree that all of us here agree that that's our biggest asset. And certainly, although our office is mainly a reactive office, our, our district attorney and our county has been committed to, you know, doing educational programs. But most importantly, what we're all forgetting here is what about the crime watch groups? I mean, these are the people who are committed every day to making our community a safer and better place to live. And I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here listening and you're talking about funding and I will tell you that I, I was proud to be a, an instructor for PCCD and on their crime prevention practitioners course and many years ago that funding was cut. So, you know, as much as, and we need crime watch groups more now than we have ever needed because these people are out there every day. Who better knows what's going on in our community than our neighbors and what's going on? And talk about gang-related stuff. They know, if we educate them, they'll know, they'll be able to report it. And I, I just think that it's, it, it gets lost in the shuffle sometimes and uh, it bothers me because we really need to reach out on a state level. I mean, it really is up to individual people in our communities who are dedicated. It's not like someone's out there saying, hey, come join our crime watch. I mean. We need to do that in order to recruit them to help the police departments and help us solve crimes. I mean, the city of Hazleton is a prime example. Last week, and I give the, the police department enormous credit because they gave their crime watch group, they just made a big drug, bu drug bust with the attorney general's office, and it really was a reflect upon that crime watch. And those are the people that are gonna be dedicated. And they're, you know, they're selfish, and they're, I should say, they're not selfish, they're, they're out there trying to do the best they can for their community. So I think you guys need to look at that on a state level and make something where you know we encourage people, have a campaign, do something that encourages people to join, find out. 
You know, in our, in our county, we have a Luzerne County Crime Watch Coalition. And I'll tell you, and we're proud to say that we have many groups and people who show up every quarter. We have quarterly meetings. And I'll tell you, the turnout's phenomenal. And those people are dedicated. So I, I, let's not forget about them. No, we're certainly not forgetting about it. I wanted to, to turn it to uh, DA Salvanis because we did want to mention about the Luzerne County Coalition of Crime Watch Groups. And, and we did make sure that we invited all our Crime Watch Groups here today. And, and of course, uh, the best example, Chief DeAndre, in, in, in the role that they played in bringing down a drug house. One of the questions, though, is how do we best coordinate that? Uh, is that best coordinated at a county level, a state level? How best do you train folks? And then the other important question, when I spoke to the uh, Plymouth Crime Watch uh, 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 last year, we talked about technology. We, we had a, a panelist from Philadelphia with the Philadelphia Police Department and, and you know, the use of, uh, of smartphones uh, and how, what a role that they can play in terms of getting a license plate or getting uh, uh, identification uh, of, of a crime scene. How do we best coordinate that? What, what's the best way to deploy our resources with Crime Watch? And, and that's why we started the Luzerne County Crime Watch Coalition. It's, it, it was started up, and we haven't had it for years. And because of this increase in crime, we felt that the Crime Watch groups are our way of becoming more proactive in the communities. So we dedicate from the district attorney's office time, money to train these individuals who, like Chaz said, are out on the streets and they dedicate their time to help um, protect their communities. It, there is one thing that I have to say when we're talking about smartphones and, and I'm sure um, Chief Desoy could chime in if he needs to. Um, there are some times that the Crime Watch um, volunteers have to be aware that if they get too involved in these um, 